Here we are in some very cold and spooky woods and I'm here today to go over my 2020 long-term bike, this Santa Cruz Highball CC Hardtail. Now, as with any long-term bike, I'm going to go into the spec, why I've chosen everything, then my ride impressions. But before that, a little disclaimer. From my nearly six and a half years working at Bike Radar, there is one thing I've learned from our audience, and that is Santa Cruz is the coolest bike brand in the world. No matter what video we do, if we haven't included a Santa Cruz or we've left out a Santa Cruz, we are sure to know about it in the comments because, again, it's the coolest bike brand. Look, it's got Santa Cruz written down it. Lots of cool people ride them. That's all you need to know. Obviously, we jest just because it has Santa Cruz written down it and it's in a very cool colour doesn't mean it's an amazing bike. What we really want to know is how it rides. Naturally, I'm going to start with the frame. Why did I choose it? Well, without sounding like a broken record, I seem to say this every year, XC tracks, XC racing, it's getting gnarlier and gnarlier. The tracks are getting harder and harder, so the bikes need to match these demands. I guess Santa Cruz is mainly known for making hardcore downhill bikes and hardcore trail and enduro bikes, so you'd hope their cross-country bikes would have fairly contemporary geometry to match the demands of modern-day cross-country racing. So, those stats. A 69.5 degree head angle and in a large a 450 millimeter reach which is pretty long for a cross-country bike the chainstay length is pretty short for a cross-country bike it's 426 millimeters that means it should be kind of nice and poppy and easy to get the front wheel up and the wheelbase is nice and long at 1140 millimeters the seat angle isn't quite what i'd like to see on a modern day cross-country bike it is 73 degrees I prefer maybe to see 74 or even 74.5, something a bit steeper, but more about that later. And finally, and the best news of all, this modern day carbon fibre cross-country bike has an external bottom bracket. Yes! <laughs> if you ever read the Bike Radar website or if you ever watch any of our reviews on YouTube, you'll know that we love external bottom brackets. They are far easier to live with than what you usually see these days, which is press fit, and we think they're great. The other thing it's got is these very on-trend drop seat stays, which means there should be a good bit of compliance in the rear end. The frame out of the box in a large with all of the hardware, all of this nice paint, weighed just over a thousand grams. Now a brief rundown of the rest of the spec. The fork is a RockShox SID Ultimate Carbon, the best fork they have available at the moment. Again, incredibly light. This one weighs just under 1,500 grams. The group set is a mishmash of various components I've chosen. A SRAM Eagle X01 cassette and rear mech. I've got a SRAM GX Eagle shifter and then a rotor Capit carbon crank with their new Inspider power meter. If my memory serves me correctly, the crank and power meter together weigh just under 550 grams, which is really light for a mountain bike setup. The wheels are actually the same wheels I had on my 2019 long termer. They are FSE XC carbons with really fancy extra light hubs. They weigh 1,190 grams. The rim width perhaps isn't the widest and they're perhaps not the stiffest wheels of all time, but again, they're incredibly light. And for someone like me that only weighs 63, 64 kilos, they are plenty stiff enough. If you're a really powerful rider and you weighed 80, 85 kilos, perhaps you want to look for something a bit stronger. Tyres is a very personal choice, and I'm sure when I tell you what tyres I've chosen, you're going to fill the comments telling me why I'm absolutely mad. They're the worst tyres ever made. I've chosen Schwalbers, Rocket Ron, Snakeskin, and 2.25. Why do I like them? Well, as someone that doesn't want to change their tyres all the time, Rocket Rons work relatively well in nearly all conditions. Having used them a lot over the last three or four years, I've also had very few punches on them. So for me, they're also very reliable. But again, let me know in the comments why I'm absolutely crazy for choosing these tires. The brakes are the Shimano XTR race version. Perhaps not the most powerful brakes in the world, but they are nice and light. Pedals are an old set of Shimano XTR. They've been working really well for the last couple of years, so no complaints there. The finishing kit is from Shimano's sister brand Pro and it's their Tharsis series. For the last few years, I've gone for 740 or 760 millimeter wide bars. So 720, which these are, did feel a bit narrow to start with, 
but I've got fairly narrow shoulders, so it didn't take me too long to get used to, and it really helps in race starts when you've got your elbows out and you're just a bit narrower to kind of sneak through those gaps. Finally, we have the ESI chunky grips. You see them a lot in XC racing. They can be a bit tricky to get on, but once they're on, mine never move, and they are incredibly comfortable. So I'm sure you all want to know what the overall weight is. And this bike here, with the two bottle cages, with the Garmin mount, weighs 9.03 kilograms. It's pretty light for a ready to race XC bike. With all of the spec out of the way, it's time to get on to what it's like to ride. I've been lucky enough to ride quite a few of the top spec cross country hardtails over the last three or four years. Specialized S-Works Epic, Scott Scale I had last year, the Cannondale FSI, the Obeya Alma, and the BMC Team Elite. After riding this bike properly for two months now, including a stage race in Lanzarote, I can safely say it is up there with the very best. However, it's not without its quirks, but first I'm gonna go over the resounding positives. I'm sure you've all had a similar experience, but often when you get a new bike, it can take a few rides before you really get used to it. There's obviously new geometry to get used to and new components, so it takes a little while. But every now and again, you jump on a bike that as soon as you get on it, it immediately feels like home. I had this with my 2018 Long Termer. That was a specialised S-Works Epic hardtail and had exactly the same experience with the highball. This was somewhat of a surprise to me and this goes to show as a bike reviewer that you can often come in with a prejudice about a bike just looking at the geometry chart. I thought with the relatively slack 73 degree seat angle, I may struggle to find a really good pedaling position over the pedals. But by slamming the seat as far forward as I could go with an inline post and with that relatively long reach, it actually pedaled really nicely. I wasn't expecting that, so it goes to show that numbers on a geometry table don't always tell the whole story. With the relatively long reach and wheelbase for an XC bike, I was curious to see how the highball was going to handle. It obviously feels stable enough on the descents for a bike like this, but even in the tight stuff, it still felt nice and easy to turn. It didn't feel too ponderous, so I was happy. The drop seat stays do provide a little bit of compliance and give when you're sitting in the saddle. How much this will help on really long marathon races, i.e. five hours, well, I need to do some really long races to find out, and that's coming later on in the year. I have raced this bike already. I've recently come back from the four-day MTB stage race in Lanzarote. That's a UCI S1 stage race. It's four days. For someone like me, it's really difficult. It's very fast. It's very rocky and very rough. I got on really well with the bike while I was there. It's not too technical, but the racing is quite kind of elbow to elbow and there's lots of dead turns and stuff like that. I didn't crash while I, while I was out there, which is always a good sign. I finished 33rd overall in the elite category, so I'm now the proud owner of two UCI points. And for an old plodder like me, I'm quite pleased with that. There's also a mountain time trial on the third day of the race. For someone like me, it takes around 58, 57 minutes on a really good day. I think the pros do it in like, 52 minutes or 50 minutes, but I did one of my best ever times on this bike in the time trial, so it goes to show it's definitely no slouch on the climbs. So on the whole, my experience of riding and racing this bike for the first two months has been resoundingly positive, but there are a couple of quirks. Now, unless you have a lab or some kind of incredible facility, stiffness is almost impossible to objectively measure whilst you're out riding. But I think the Santa Cruz possibly isn't quite as stiff as something like a specialised S-Work Epic that I rode in 2018. Whether this is down to those drop seat stays or the narrower bottom bracket shell you get from using an external bottom bracket, I'm not too sure. But there is this slight feeling for me that it isn't as earth-shatteringly stiff as something like that S-Works Epic. Again, componentry can affect how stiff a bike feels, so it could be down to something like the wheels or the cranks. But without putting the bike in a lab or some kind of machine, it's impossible to really tell for sure. I'm not even sure if having the stiffest bike in the world is actually what you want. I've already raced this bike, and as you know, I was no slower on it, so it's definitely not kind of costing me anything in terms of time or watts, 
So perhaps having a bike that's ever so slightly less stiff actually helps you with a bit of compliance and comfort. So I'm not even sure if it's a bad thing, but it's definitely something I wanted to mention. The other small issue I had when I first got the bike was that there was some slight water ingress into the frame. The highball has quite a large port for an XC bike underneath the down tube near the bottom bracket. That means doing things like your internal cable routing can be a bit easier because you've got some simple access down there. However, it's also a place that water can creep in if that port isn't tight enough. And I think that could have been the issue is that just when I had the frame to start with, that port hadn't been done up tight enough when I'd done the cable routing. Once I'd done it up tight enough, the issue seems to have gone away. But it's worth mentioning that if you have this bike, that's something you want to keep an eye on. It's also worth mentioning that in Bristol where I live, the winter so far has been incredibly wet. So perhaps any bike would have got water in it eventually because if you ride a bike in the wet for long enough, eventually water is going to creep in to certain places. Hopefully you can tell by now that I've really enjoyed riding this bike and I've been really impressed with it. As I've already mentioned, there's only a few times you jump on a bike and it immediately feels like home and this is one of those bikes. I'm hoping to do plenty more events on this bike in the coming year, so keep an eye on Bike Radar for those updates. But I'd like to know what you guys think. Is this the sort of XC bike you'd like to ride, a hardtail, or should I have picked something else? As always, let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so that every time we upload a video, you get a notification. Goodbye!